Welcome back to another episode of Better Than I Found It, the podcast all things college golf. You're listening to Mike McGraw, the men's golf coach at Baylor. Joining me today is Mikkel Barrick Andreessen, my associate head coach here at Baylor. Mikkel and I have a special and unusual podcast for you today. Recently, I reached out to 20 professional golfers and I asked them all the same question. And that question is, what do you wish you had known in college that would have made your transition to professional golf easier? Now, their answers are both intriguing and insightful. And I think you'll want to share this episode with any aspiring college golfer. I know you'll enjoy it. Okay, better than I found it, listeners. Uh, Welcome to this very special podcast today. I think something that's really going to be interesting. Joining me is my associate head golf coach here at Baylor, Mikkel Barrick Andreessen. Mikkel, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Coach. Good to be here, and you're getting better at pronouncing my name every time. I need you to do it more often. Well, you know, I just thought about it. If I went all the way over to Oslo and started trying to get people to pronounce my name they probably couldn't do it very well either Uh, right mike mcgraw is pretty off the shelf (laughs) that's a pretty easy what do you think i think that'd be okay all right well mike mcgraw okay good well anyway thank you for joining me um you know you and i over the summer were kind of batting around some ideas of things we could do with the golf team and uh just interesting ideas to come up with uh things that we think would help prepare them to be a professional golfer And, and you came up with an idea of doing a series of kind of presentations. So tell me about how you came up with that idea initially. Yeah, sure. I think you and I talked a lot about, um, and we talked to our former players, you know, we have some um, common former players that we both coached here at Baylor the last couple of years, but then we also have uh, differing former players that I coached at Texas Tech or you had at Oklahoma State or whatever it is. And a common theme is, um, you know, Pro life is different than college life. And so we came up with this idea together that why don't we try and educate our guys a little bit better this year about what it actually takes. Um, Anything from the level of golf to how life is to the cost of it. Um, And let's do a little bit of an educational series. And um, you um, came up with a great idea to educate our guys on something to start off the year. And that's really what this podcast um, is. And it was awesome and an awesome session with our uh, with our guys. Well, thank you for that. First of all, thank you for kind of encouraging me to to do this because if you think about it, we're preparing them for life, but we're they're hoping we're preparing them for a life in professional golf. Mm-hmm. Statistics would say that not that many play professional golf, and that's okay. But the things that you're going to hear today would prepare you for both professional golf and for life both. And mm-hmm. so, my first thought on this what was that I would reach out to former players or guys I know that are playing professional golf and ask them the question. And the question is, what I wish I had known in college golf. What should I have known in college that would have made this transition to professional golf way easier? And all of these guys I reached out to had something. And it's quite frankly, well, tell tell me your reaction because I did this without you knowing what I was doing and then I showed it to you. Yeah, it was uh pretty cool because I think there's about 20 guys on there and differing tours, so you have everything on here from uh controversial live tour through PJ tour, corn free tour, mini tours. And so there are some common themes and then um there are a lot of things that I even hadn't thought about as a coach that were just kind of small nuggets that these guys wish they would have known in college and that's exactly what we're trying to educate our guys on right is what are we how are we preparing them for pro life after and um what are they kind of not picking up on in college golf that could make them better so um i thought it was a great way to start and i think the guys learned a lot during our session well thank you and also i think we as coaches got better just by reading this so it was really good so okay we're going to, our first professional we're going to start with is your college roommate, Kyle Jones, who's a Corn Ferry Tour member. He's one of the Corn Ferry Tour, and Kyle, to me, is a brilliant, in, in a simplistic way, one of the most brilliant guys I've ever known. You lived with him for four years. T- tell the listeners about Kyle a little bit. 
Yeah, Kyle is uh, very talented, but he's he's also hardworking and very smart in his own way of getting really good at golf. He thinks very simplistic, just like you said. I remember uh, struggling with ball striking several points during my college career. And one time I was working with Coach Blag at a range after a round at a tournament, and I, I was just having him check my start line and my curve and, hey, where did that start, Coach, and where did it curve to and I was hitting it awful, and Kyle comes up and he said, "Hey, buddy, like, why don't you just do like me and hit it straight? It's <laughs> it's so much easier. Why are you overcomplicating this?" And um, and he was serious. Yes, and, he was. And that that's a little window into how he thinks about golf. It's it's super simple yet genius at the same time. Yeah, like I said, genius. I meant it because mm. simpli- simplicity is genius to me. So anyway, your your roommate Kyle was obviously an All American twice. He was an Arnold Arnold Palmer Cupper, so he he was obviously a great player here at Baylor. And his comment when I asked the question, "What I wish I had known in college? What you wish you had known when you were in college? It would make golf much easier as a professional." He said, "The thing I wish I had known." was how important it is to really learn and understand the best way to prepare Monday through Wednesday of a tournament week on the PGA Tour. Everyone is different. Purposeful practice is better than wasting time or just going through the motions. So basically Kyle's saying he did a terrible job when he first got out there of Monday through Wednesday, the three days leading up to a tournament. And honestly, I've heard other professionals say the same thing. It's like, I just didn't do a good job with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was... um You'll see this in, in a couple others later, too. But I thought that was pretty good from Kyle. Yeah, Monday through Wednesday. And it, it it doesn't mean you have to grind 12 hours a day. And that's probably what he learned early on. He thought he just practiced all day long. He was usually worn out. So mm-hmm. really, really good wisdom from from a guy that, you know, as you said, it. he's really smart in his own way about getting his own best golf out. In fact, one of the things that he taught me as a coach was the first week I was at Baylor. And he was signing his golf glove that put on that we just went out for practice. And a week later when we started qualifying, and, and this story is documented in a book I wrote, but it's worth telling again now. And he signed another glove the next week, his own glove. And I asked him, Kyle, why do you sign your gloves? And he said, well, you know, I, I spent my whole freshman year trying to hit it as far as all these guys I was playing against. And I quit being me. I just quit playing the kind of golf I normally play. So when I sign my glove and I look down at my glove when I'm at a dress, I see my name. And it reminds me to play Kyle Jones golf. And to me, that's genius in simplicity. It's just be yourself. Mm-hmm. So, Well, good stuff from Kyle. And he's a podcast <clears throat> alum. So if you want to hear the full story, go back early in the podcast feed. I think around episode three or four. So Right. And Kyle tells that story for sure. Yeah. Okay, next up is Colin Morikawa. I don't think he needs a lot of introduction. I think most people in the world of golf know him. He's won a couple of major championships. He's an All-American at Cal and really a terrific guy and also a former Better Than I Found It podcaster. Uh, Colin, I have so much respect for this guy. I really do, and I know a lot of people do. You, uh, You did not actually compete against him in college. I think he came right on the heels of your college career. That's correct. But we, we got to play with Cal a bunch, mm-hmm. and so I got to walk a lot of fairways with him. Pretty amazing guy. And this is what Colin writes. I would say begin now creating a routine or prep work for every event that you play in. Nearly every professional has some routine, whether it's short or long, they have something. The problem with trying to create your own when you turn pro is you start to copy other pros and end up not creating one that focuses on your needs. The prep work or routine will continuously evolve, but if you start early on, like now, and really have it down, once you turn pro and start traveling for multiple weeks, the downtime away from actually warming up and playing will become much easier. Because of this, time management will be more efficient. And sort of along the lines of Kyle Jones, it's like, Man, you've got to streamline this, and you've got to make it yours. And what he's basically saying here is don't go out and just copy other tour pros. Create your own, even though it will evolve. Create your own so you don't have to try to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. And interesting is sort of along the same lines as Kyle. So two for two now on, hey, you need to find your own formula and preparing um, for a tournament week and how you're going to do it. And it works in college golf. Probably would really be a separator in college golf if you, you did a better job. And me, when I heard both of these guys talk about this, 
it reminded me it's really important how you and I prepare a team mm -hmm. the two or three days leading up and then what we're doing the morning of and the afternoons after rounds and and I don't think we've done nearly a good enough job mm -hmm. in my time at Baylor and I want to do better mm -hmm. both those guys remind especially me especially in educating the players in how do you prepare best yourself and um, I definitely think we need to do a good job with providing an environment where they learn how they prepare best themselves. Totally. And then within the team concept, allow them that individuality for mm -hmm. sure. Next is Hunter Mahan. Uh, Hunter played golf at Oklahoma State. I was the assistant coach there when he was playing golf. And Hunter is maybe one of the hardest workers I've seen of all the players I've coached. He definitely worked hard. He was a top 10 or 15 player in the world for a seven or eight year period. So a really, really great player. Probably doesn't need an introduction either. But here's what Hunter came up with. Lots of things come to mind, but I can narrow it down to two specific attributes that professional golfers have that separate them from good college players. The first is know thyself. Every player must know and understand his strengths and weaknesses. From a swing perspective to a mental and emotional perspective, they need to know themselves to be comfortable with the tools they have. Example would be Matt, Matt Fitzpatrick. Players also need to practice situational golf and understand how the situation may dictate your play. Example, Thigala at Hartford this year, trying to hit out of that bunker at 18 with a one-stroke lead was reckless to say the least. Wow, Hunter. Got him. Uh, secondly, I can't overemphasize this enough, but staying in the moment is the simplest and hardest thing for anyone to accomplish. This will be an everyday challenge for a lifetime. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, when we talked about this as a team, a couple of the guys mentioned that staying in the moment thing, and that really stood out to them. Because what we had them do as a team is read through this in sort of small groups and then come back and discuss it a little bit. And um, a couple of them really paid attention to that last sentence by Hunter there, of staying in the moment. Yep, it's good. And I, I know that when he was playing his best, best golf, he was accomplishing that way better than when he's playing his bad golf, so... Well, that's a three for three. He said, know thyself early on. So if you'd slot it under a, a broad bucket there of sort of getting to know yourself and how you prepare your, the best for yourself, that's three for three so far. Totally. Totally. Next is Peter Uline, who was a U.S. amateur champion while playing for me at Oklahoma State. and uh, He's played both the Corn Ferry and the PGA Tour, now the Live Tour. So Peter's a very accomplished player, no doubt. What I wish I had known in college. Here we go. I wish I had known how much more golf I was expected to play. In college, and amateur golf felt like it was about 12 college events, maybe seven or eight amateur events uh, through 12-month schedule, so around 20 events. Most of those only three-day events, whereas on tour, it's anywhere from 30 to 35 weeks a year, six days per week. College golf was, at most, four days a week. So right there, he's just talking about the volume that you play is much, much greater. He goes on to say, it took me a while to figure out a plan that worked for me to keep my body and mind fresh, but the only way to learn that was through reps. Anyway, it was a shock to the mind and the body right away after turning pro. I wish I'd known that so I could have been more prepared. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's very, when you do that three years in a row, let's say, I think one year playing 30 events, you might not think about it as much, but when you put three years together of 30 to 35 events, um, you got to be good at managing energy and and time. And the guys on our team discussed this too. So I don't think you can fully prepare, though, even just knowing these things. You can't really fully prepare until you're there. You and that's what he said it. about getting the reps. You've got to go through it. Exactly. But just like Hunter and Colin and Kyle right before him, he talks about his plan, about how he was going to, create a plan for himself. So I think that all four of these first four guys speak to, this is a very individual game we play. And so a, a, a lesson to a coach would be to understand you've got 10 individuals there. There needs to be a different plan in a big portion of this, a different plan for every player within a team environment or a team concept. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, I mean, he just knew what, what we expected of him in college. And actually professional golf, there's a lot more expected. Got to be ready. Right. Okay, next up is Harold Varner the third. Harold played East Carolina and obviously a very well-known golfer, uh, also has joined the Live Tour recently. 
I said, man, that's a tough question, coach. <laughs> How about this? It's never as bad as you think it is or as good as you think it is. In college, we live in a society where we're always comparing ourselves with others. Just run your race. I love this one. Mm-hmm. The guys, this was a big favorite among the guys, too. Pretty, uh, pretty direct and yeah, to very, the point. Yeah, very direct. He didn't have a lot to say, but what he said was very poignant, for mm-hmm. sure. Next is a player named Taylor Gooch, who's also a live tour player, but also played golf for me at Oklahoma State. I recruited, that was probably my best job of recruiting. I got a big, big Oklahoma fan, Oklahoma football fan, who was personal friends with Sam Bradford, the Heisman Trophy winner at OU, to come to Oklahoma State. But that's another story. Taylor goes on to say uh, his, how he answered the question. I didn't understand how good professional golfers were. It hit me at Q school my first year when I was playing against men who had families. And I realized that uh, golf was their way to provide, not just for the sport they loved. Yes, I enjoyed working hard, but there was a difference between working hard and trying to be my best. A big difference. I like that. When I turned pro, I was so focused on just getting my PGA Tour card. And one day it dawned on me that if my sights were set on that alone, what was next? I had to recalibrate and set bigger goals for myself. Once I realized that I needed to attempt to become the best player in the world, it changed my everyday attitude and approach to my craft. I fell in love with getting the most out of every day. Finally, I wish that in college I would have been bigger and greater. Asp- I wish I would have had bigger and greater aspirations than I had. It took me a couple of years as a professional to realize that I had to flip my mindset from I got to get on tour to I need to go figure out how to, to get better today. So it was more of a, a today thing for him. So figure out how to fall in love with getting the most out of each day. 99% of the guys there are attempting to be more focused and outwork you. Don't let them do that. Along the same lines, pretty um, talking about goal setting. That's maybe the first one to talk about some goal setting. I loved how he recalibrated because his goal originally since he started playing the game was to play professional golf. Mm-hmm. And he realized, wait, what, what's next if I, if I get that goal accomplished? Mm-hmm. I think we all have small goals that are short term, but you have to continually reevaluate and, as he said, recalibrate. So. Mm-hmm. Thoughtful, though, and long answer. Yeah, it was a long one. Appreciate that. Uh, next up, Trey Mullinex. Trey was an All-American at Alabama, played on two national championship teams has won on both the Corn Ferry and PGA Tour, is, I'm, I'm pretty sure, going to be the only uh, tour player to come out of the Gardendale, Mountain, <laughs> Mount Olive, Alabama uh, area, I would think. Uh, but a, a great guy and a, really just a good old boy from the country. Um, Trey said, for me, I think I struggled and still do with designing practice for myself. What we did in college was so good. I was able to learn so much from team practice and following Corey, Bobby, and JT around that I never learned how to practice on my own. It was great in a team setting, but when I moved to Sea Island as a professional, I had a hard time with practice by myself. I would encourage college players to find a way to make it fun and know that they're getting good work in. So Mm -hmm. here he had all these great examples around him, all guys who played the PGA Tour, uh, but didn't he he was just copying them again and and when he got on his own out on tour it just wasn't easy for him Mm -hmm. so it seems like in college golf or maybe not doing a good enough job about teaching the player about what it takes for them individually because this is like the seventh guy that talks about my planning my practice what i do monday through wednesday there's different variations of this but it kind of boils down to I wasn't prepared to play Trey Mole next golf. Mm, I like that. It, it's kind of crazy <clears throat> since none of these guys knew that these other guys were being asked this question. It's hard to believe mm-hmm. that they overlap so nicely, but mm-hmm. it shows you what themes are important to be successful as a professional. Mm-hmm. And all we're asking the, the pro is what would, have, what would you have started in college? Mm-hmm. So if, if college players are listening to this, they should be able to get little bits and pieces and nuggets, I would think. I know I have. For sure. All right, next up, Bo Van Pelt, top 10 machine, money machine. The guy was just an absolute machine before he got injured and has come back to play pro golf again uh, and not quite back at the level where he was before, but truly one of the nice guys in the game of golf for sure, uh, but also very, very talented. Bo says, 
I wish I had realized the value of knowing my swing and my tendencies. It's important to have a good swing coach, but more important that he educates you on what causes your misses. This way you can correct yourself during the round. I have learned that being consistent with a good warm-up routine in the locker room or gym before the round, activating your body in a proper way. So I've learned that since being a professional. You can never be too good inside 150 yards. If you don't know your distances, you'll never reach your potential as a player. Also, I've learned to be your own best friend on the golf course. I didn't know that in college. Beating yourself up is a complete waste of time, and it only helps your competition. When when did he play his majority of professional golf? Uh, 1999 nice. through 2016. Yep. So he's 20 years prior to Trey Mullenix, but right, right. similar stuff. Um, never too good inside 150. Be your own best friend on the golf course, but then knowing your swing and your tendencies. I think when you play 30 to 35 weeks a year, you just got to figure out a way to get the ball around the golf course a lot of days when it doesn't feel good. I mean, in college, you have the luxury of having two weeks in between and you can kind of work on things maybe not as efficiently and uh, be able to leave for a golf tournament when you kind of feel good. But 35 weeks out of the year, you're not going to feel good, um, you know, all those weeks for sure. No no chance. And and for, you think of the amount of good golf Bo has played – over a over a twenty five year period almost right now that's it's like that obviously works and he's figured something out he wishes he'd known it in college <laughs> he'd have gotten it earlier so all right next up is Baylor alum Cooper Dossie Cooper was the first team All American here at Baylor for for me and was also an Arnold Palmer Cupper great player he's the only player in the la- in the in professional golf on sanctioned events to have shot in the fifties twice in the last twelve months. Just kind of a he shot a fifty nine and a fifty eight. Mm-hmm. You done anything like that recently? Usually that's thirteen or fourteen holes for you and me. Yeah, not recently. I can't uh, <laughs> can't claim that. I can't claim that either. But Cooper is a uh, a master around the greens. Has unbelievable hands. Uh, has a lot of confidence. Hits mm-hmm. at a mile for his size. Cooper's going to be a really good professional golfer, no doubt. And so this is really good because he played all five years basically for me. So And he played one year for you. So mm-hmm. you, you know him as well. Cooper says, a few ideas come to mind. Learning to go low. Oh, okay, he's learned to do that. Uh, literally trying to play from the front tees or anything to teach yourself how to go as physically low as possible. You have to shoot five under or lower basically every day on these tours. Mm-hmm. Then time management is something I wish I'd done a better job of in college. Ask yourself if you need the extracurricular activity. Will it benefit me in the long run? Also, working out is very important, but more specifically, recovery. I didn't do any recovery on, on a scheduled basis in college. You need to do ice, Normatec boots, Theragun, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very important. So I watched Cooper. Yeah, he didn't do a very good job of those things when he was in college. Now, he did learn how to go low. Mm-hmm. I'm sure glad. Uh, but I mean, you're playing a tour where you have to shoot low. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter which tour it is. I mean, just look at the winning scores: twenty under. Yeah, and you, uh, try to Monday qualify without going low. See see how you'll do there. I think he's right about that. Now that fifty eight and fifty nine will always Monday qualify, Cooper. If yeah, you're listening, <laughs> that always works. All right, another Baylor golfer, Mark Reppy, who just graduated last spring and and recently just last week got through first stage mm-hmm. of Corn Ferry Tour School. His first time through to get through first stage, so that's really exciting for Mark. And he came out to watch us two days ago he at did. Trinity Forest. He was out at Trinity Forest watching us, and so was Garrett May, one of our former players as well. Yeah. We were really thrilled to see both of those guys. Actually, Cooper was to the first day. So That's right. Wow. A, lot of, a lot of golfers here watching us. But. Great. Well, Mark says, I would say I wish I would have had a more holistic point of view in college. What I mean by that is not just focusing on the physical components of my golf game. I learned that you must also take care of your body and your mind. At the professional level, there are slim margins between different guys that have a great mental game and a fit body can give you that edge. Sam Bennett is a great example of a guy who knows who he is and he has a great mental game because he has a strong belief in himself. Sam Bennett, the recent U.S. Amateur champion. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about what Mark says? That's from a guy that just graduated four months ago. He did. So it's kind of cool to see 
all across the board here. Bo Van Pelt, who played in the 90s, to Mark Reppy, just graduated. Um, but, yeah, I, I like that from Mark, too. You know, he's uh, kind of getting the taste of it right now, and uh, we're very happy for him getting through first stage. And then he's played some miniature golf and this summer, and I'm, I'm telling you, they're shooting low out there, too. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you think about it, you're playing a an APT event, and – you know, you sh- at Brownwood, Texas, and you shoot twenty six hundred, and you're runner up. It's like, what is happening here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's good for the game of golf, though that people are shooting that low. Yeah. All right, next up, Robbie Shelton, uh, two time All American at the University of Alabama. Uh, he's actually in a ju- as a junior golfer was the only player to beat Jordan Spieth at the U.S. Junior in a three year period. Uh, he kept Jordan from winning three in a row. So, but he was also a great, great player and. And I was able to walk with him in 2014 at the national championship. Love this guy. Awesome kid. Real quiet, understated, but really talented. Corn Ferry Tour member right now. Um, and we'll have his PJ Tour card, I guess, next year. That's correct. Mm-hmm. I wish I had known how to be in control of my mind when I was went into professional golf as a 21-year-old. Stepping out of your comfort zone more and more in college will only help you're in pressure-filled situations in professional golf and in life. It's not an easy life, grinding every single day, but it can be very rewarding. So he talks about pressure-filled situations. Mm-hmm. And wishing that he'd be in total control of his mind when he walked into professional golf. I don't know how realistic that is, but this is exactly what we're trying to get at. It's just... I think to have your mind in the right space, you need to know what it takes, first of all. And um, hearing what these guys are saying is is pretty interesting. Maybe that would have helped Robbie. I'm not sure. Well, I know he talks about pressure-filled situations. It's really easy to go about golf in a comfortable way. Mm -hmm. And so when we throw something out there in a qualifying that kind of sets guys back on their heels, some guys look at me like I've got three heads. You know, like, why are you doing this? And I'm only doing it. And by the way, I can never say or do anything as bad to you as you do to yourself in competition. Mm -hmm. So he's saying prepare your mind for these pressure pack situations. Prepare and train like that. Okay, very good. Okay, next up, one of the grittiest players I've ever um, recruited, uh, recruited, but didn't get, but then also coached against, and that is Max McGreevy, who's a current PGA Tour member, and he won on the Corn Ferry Tour as well. Max writes, if I had to answer that, I would probably say that I wish I would have told myself or known that there would be so many setbacks along the way. You become such a good amateur and college player, you think things will work out automatically out of college. Sometimes they do, but you should always push yourself to make it happen. But knowing that there will be a setback or two along your journey just makes you more comfortable when that moment comes. The way you can face it, understand what went wrong, and get back on the trajectory needed to help succeeding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't shoot 65, there will be setbacks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's cool, especially from a guy that has now actually gone through the ranks and is on the PJ Tour and he's won on the Corn Ferry Tour and he's kind of gotten there. And I believe, Max, when did he graduate? Coach? 20... Graduated in 2017. 17. So he's five years out right now. So. That's a pretty good trajectory, in my opinion, getting on tour in five years. And there's still plenty of setbacks in that time for him. You know, it's crazy. I think Colin Morikawa and uh, Victor Hovland and Matthew Wolf kind of ruined that for everybody. They've got everybody thinking, if I don't do it right away, then there's a problem. And that's not the case at all. Mm-hmm. Here's a guy that's five years in and just kind of hitting his stride. And I think the way Max approaches things and with as much grit as he's got, he's got talent, obviously, too. But right now he's he's learned to overcome a lot of those obstacles that he wasn't positive were going to be there. <laughs> they're there. No, nope. they're there in pro golf, too, for sure. But they are, absolutely. Next up, Webb Simpson, the former Wake Forest golfer, 2012 U.S. Open champion. Great guy. I coached him on the Arnold Palmer Cup team back in 2007. <laughs> so we had a pretty good team that year. Um, but uh, Webb is just really one of the truly good guys in the game of golf. Uh, just I think everybody believes that and knows it. He's also very competitive, and I think he's a great example to me of somebody who can walk his faith, be a good guy, be who he is, and still be a relentless competitor. He's got all that. He writes, 
I wish I would have invested the money in myself and gotten a world-class team around me from the start. If you can afford it, it's worth it. No world-class player has ever gotten to where they are without a really good team around them. You can't name a player in the top 20 in the world who doesn't have multiple people on their team. Go ahead. This was one of my favorites. Obviously, I'm a coach for a living, and so I'm passionate about coaching and other things, but it was just so like off the beaten path a little bit with these answers. It was very original, and I love that. Like, I wish I would have invested the money in myself and gotten the world-class team around me from the start. That's a pretty cool take. Yeah, and I've, I've known some players who uh, tried to uh, go cheaper at the beginning. Yeah. You know, don't pay for a real caddy. Just get a, a guy, a knockabout caddy, you know, mm-hmm. from week to week to week. And you, if you're not investing yourself, what are you investing in? Because mm-hmm. you are a corporation, you know. So I think that's really, really good wise and and honestly you need people around you that care about you too and i I know he's got a great team around him which is great Mm -hmm. next is another uh, palmer cupper that played for me back in 2007 billy horschel who's won everything but a major i mean he's won a lot of tour events he's won world golf championships he's won uh, the fedex cup he's done a great job as a professional golfer and been good his whole career out there and he's won this year so he's a great player Billy's one of the most competitive guys on tour, and you can see it in the way uh, that he competes. But Billy writes two things, the ability to say no and time management. Once you get on the PGA Tour, you get lots of club reps wanting you to try their product, media wanting to talk to you, sponsors always wanting your time. You have to learn to say no, and it's okay to say it. You have to, to do what's best for you to play well every week. There's a time and a place to fulfill the requests that come in. So learning to say no is one of the big first ones. The next one is time management. I've always been great at scheduling my time, but I've seen other pros who aren't. Plan your day and your week out. Practice time, workout time, sponsor time, relaxation time. Treat it as if you were working at a regular job. The more diligent with this part, the better prepared you will be, and you won't always be playing catch up. Do not rush your practice and get sidetracked that keep you from fully completing the practice that you want to do. Time is a commodity. You only have so much daylight every day to improve your golf game, so make sure you're using it wisely, both at tournaments and at home. Really good here. I feel like you said time like eight times during that quote. So time, time, time. But my favorite is the say no. We see that in every, every life, really, but... I bet those guys get absolutely hammered by a lot of stuff, right and left, saying no. That's that's hard to do, but like you said, it's okay to say it. He, he did say it was okay to say it. You know, you see a lot of guys that win a major. I say a lot of guys. Very few guys win majors. But when somebody who wins a major that doesn't normally win one and then their game goes in the in the tank for a little bit, it's he's not saying no or he's not he's being overpulled too many directions. And what he's saying is if you want to play well, and this is in a college life, too, because we, as coaches, we tell our players, you've got a school life, you've got a golf team life or preparing for that, you've got a social life, you've got a, a spiritual life, and you just can't add a lot of other stuff, and you've got to figure out what's most important in there, because time is a commodity, and you only have so much time. And to be a really good college player, or even a college coach, you have to manage your time well. I think he's saying, like, it's not, it's time management is not to add more, it's to say no. Yes. It's just to get back to meat and potatoes, which is having the time that he needs to practice. Totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, next is one, uh, my good friend Brian uh, Gathright, who teaches down in San Antonio. I told him I was going to do this, and he he took it on his own to go ahead and ask a couple of his players that he teaches, or one that he taught in the past. And so these next two are from Brian. Um, the first one was Mitchell Meisner, who's just, gosh, played so well over the last year, and he's just on his way in professional golf. He played at Rice. And uh, this one, of all of these, this is one of my favorites that we got, and so I'll read this. Mitchell writes, I think I would have honestly had different expectations of my coach if I had known it was on me to get better and not to rely only on him. If I had gone to him with my own ideas of how to get better, I think it would have been beneficial early in my pro career. Instead of just learning, leaning on my instructor, I should have been more proactive and professional. 
It's really about you being mature enough to accept the responsibility for being as good as I can possibly be. In other words, to lead my own development and not just wait for somebody else to show me something. Now, before I, before you comment on this, I'm not, I don't think he's saying that you shouldn't have an instructor. I don't think he's saying you shouldn't have mentors. He's saying you can't just lean on them. It's not them. They're not hitting the shots anyway. What do you think? I think it takes time to learn your own game. And it's such a common theme with so many of these is how to prepare, knowing your swing, knowing your tendencies. And you got to start investing in yourself. Um, if you have coaches and instructors that are willing to teach you how to coach yourself, I think that's what a lot of these guys are pointing to, that they wanted to do more of this in college so they didn't have to spend years one and two when – on tour when they're playing 35 weeks a year and they're by themselves having to learn this stuff while playing for money. I think a lot of them are saying, I wish I would have spent my four years in college learning my own game and it's on me to teach myself my own tendencies so I can self-correct and progress the way I want to. Very good. And I think it's served Mitchell quite well, honestly, that attitude. He's, he's on his way in pro golf. The next one would be from Noda Begay. Noda is obviously a well-known player. He played at Stanford, played on a national championship team, won two or three times, or at least maybe four times on the PGA Tour. Great player. He's a commentator today and a really good guy in the game of golf. He said, I wish I would have known that statistically I should be playing away from certain pins and yardages. Uh, this will actually improve my scoring and better prepare me for a championship golf. So he didn't think about that at all. He just kind of hit it from point A to point B mm -hmm. and uh, kind of always went at the flags. I think that is maybe a little bit better these days in general than when Noda Begay played. He mm -hmm. played at Stanford, is that correct? Yes. And graduated maybe in the 90s? He did. Uh, okay. So I think there's a little bit um, more knowledge out there and – you know, some other former podcasters such as Scott Fawcett and other people have been kind of at the forefront of sort of more information regarding playing strategy and college coaches are probably better at these things these days. But yeah, it's on you. I mean, when you uh, like a golf course, we saw this fall when you're at Olympia Fields mm. and that thing is tucked three from the right edge and off the back and uh, I mean... Long and right of that thing is dead every time on tour. And you got to find a way to commit to a shot to the center of the green. And, um, yeah, if, if you're not able to do that when you go out, you're going to lose a lot of money. So. Well, you know, coaches, when Noda was playing, we were trying to teach these things, but we didn't have shot link. We didn't have the modern-day statistics, strokes, gain statistics. We didn't have all of that to prove our point. Mm -hmm. So the modern day has kind of come up that he didn't have that ability. He wishes he had known it at that time. Very good stuff. Next up is Davis Riley, an All-American from the University of Alabama and a, a great Corn Ferry Tour member and now PGA Tour member, just a really up-and-coming. I mean, he's just got a swing that you would you could mm -hmm. just set it to music. It's the most beautiful golf swing going. Uh, really, really good. And Davis writes, One thing I wish I would have known in college is that I didn't have to be perfect to be good. Being me is good enough. It's easy to think that to get to the next level, pro golf, that you have to be reinvent the wheel. You don't have to do that to be one of the best players in the world. I should have been aware that the blueprint that got me to where I was good enough. Uh, I just had to trust and execute it on a daily basis. Efficiency over quantity in preparation. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I love, I love that. What I love about it, he talks about get to the next level, of which is pro golf. You know, a, a long time ago, I learned that, you know, everybody – a lot of people will tell you to get to the next level, you have to abandon everything that got you where you are. And that's what he's saying right here. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I've got a pretty good blueprint here for some success. And I think next level, when somebody says you have to just quit everything you're doing to get to the next level, I, I would like to remind them there's a next level below you too. And a lot of times you can find that level if you just abandon things that work. So don't, don't reinvent the wheel. And good golf travels, don't ever forget that. Let me, as a Scandinavian, test my southern sayings here. Okay. Isn't there a saying that goes something like, dance with the girl who brought you? Or dance with the girl who brought you. Yeah, Daryl Royal, the University to, of Texas football coach, yeah. said that. Yeah, That's it. I love that. That's great. I can't believe a Norwegian knows that saying. Really good. Uh, okay, we're going to go here to our next player, which is Taylor Moore. Taylor was a uh, Edmond High School graduate, Edmond, Oklahoma, 
played at the University of Arkansas, and he's won on the Corn Ferry Tour, and he's on the PGA Tour now, and just a really up-and-coming player, a really good guy. Taylor writes, I wish I had known what effective discipline work and practice was while I was in college. I used to think it just meant being at the course for 8 to 10 hours. Now that I have a plan, I get a ton of quality work in in just 2 or 3 hours. There's obviously times to spend all day at the course, but with no plan or discipline, it might not be quality. I think Taylor works with Josh Gregory, doesn't he? He does. Josh is like really, really good at structuring these things, and you can see that he's helped Taylor a ton with with uh, how to organize his practice and get stuff done. Josh was on the podcast too, so you can go back and listen to his episode. Taylor was as well, but um, again... I really like this stuff um, because it's about, hey, I figured out these are the things that work for me and this is how how I need to do it in uh, professional golf to be Taylor Moore. Pretty cool. Very good. Okay, my last professional here is a good friend of mine uh, who played the tour from 1985 through about 2009, then played the Champions Tour for a while. It's Bob Tway. Bob won the 1986 PGA Championship. I think he won eight times in the PGA Tour. His son, Kevin, played for me at Oklahoma State as well. Uh, But Bob has seen the highs and the lows of the professional golf. And he saw a lot of highs, but he saw some lows too. And he has some very good wisdom here I want to share with you all. He says, I wish I had known several things. When your game does not feel good and you feel like you're miles from playing well, you're really never that far away. One good shot or feel can turn it around quite quickly. Also, when things aren't going well, don't wait until you're to the backside or tomorrow to regroup. Get your attitude and determination to change things now, not later. So I think that's really, really good advice because some kids think, well, it's just not my day. Not my day. <laughs> it's not over. And he, So anyway, I love that advice. He, in the next paragraph, he says, when trying to get better, If you can improve just one shot per day, that's four shots per tournament, that's approximately 40 places on tour, so lots of money. One more fairway, one more green hit, or one more made putt. Think of it that way, opposed to redoing your whole golf game. Attitude is your most important skill. Most shots are missed before they're hit, or attitude. I had to learn all these things as a pro. I wish I had known them as an amateur. Maybe my favorite, too. I love that. That's why I saved it for last. I mean, it's just a ton of good information there. And you think about it, you're talking about a guy who was the Fred Haskins Award winner. So he's the best college player. He was the PGA Tour Player of the Year and a major champion. He was the best professional for a time. And he had to learn all these things, and he had to learn them the hard way, too. Um, A humble, quiet guy, but he had a lot to say here. One other thing he said to me that's not in this... uh, Thing that he returned here, but a long time ago he told me, he said, don't ever become too dependent on someone else for all your answers. And that speaks to what some of these other guys said, uh, Mitchell Meisner for one. It's like, I've, I've got to take some responsibility here. It can't always be somebody else that's my problem or my solution. Correct? Mm-hmm. Bob Tway, pretty genius on that. Yeah. This was also probably one of the favorite amongst our guys, the one that was brought up a lot for sure. Yeah, so so what we want to do kind of here uh, in s- summary is just kind of talk about this is 20 professional golfers at all levels, and some of them not even playing anymore, but they've all played professional golf at a high level. And there's some overarching themes that kind of go, and one of them we can definitely talk about, and I think college coaches could benefit from this. It's teach your player to create his own story. He's writing his own book. It's not like I have to copy off this kid everything he's doing or whatever. It doesn't mean you don't steal things. I mean, I know something you you had to learn something from a professional golfer or from a college player. You learned something from Kyle Jones. What's one thing you learned from Kyle while playing college golf? I mean, his simplistic mindset really helped me not overcomplicate things. Okay, but you didn't try to be Kyle Jones. <clears throat> Mm-mm. No. So it's like coaches, you could help your players by taking this advice that these professionals talk about, which is be yourself, learn what works for you and go do it. And the immediacy of doing it now, don't don't wait until you've suffered on in professional golf for several years. Start creating this. Write your own book. Start it now. You know, so and how awesome of these guys to to share with us. I know our guys really like this. So 
thanks to everyone who has sent in their their thoughts and uh, shared with our guys. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited about the series you and I are going to be doing with the guys over the next year or so. And perhaps we get another one of these that you and I both like a lot and we'll, uh, we'll figure out a way to make it another podcast episode. But Mikkel, thank you so much for adding your uh, color commentary, if you will, to, to the episode today. It's really been good getting your perspectives. And uh, again, I would like to thank all these professionals for doing the same. Sure thing. Thanks, Coach. Okay. Thanks.